Tēnākoto, tēnākoto, kia ora koutou koutou koa. Welcome distinguished guests, academic colleagues, students, supporters and friends to the inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Petra Butler from the Faculty of Law. My name is Professor Grant Guilford, I'm Vice-Chancellor of Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand's globally ranked capital city university and New Zealand's first ranked university for research quality. It's my great pleasure to host you all this evening. Professor Butler is one of New Zealand's leading Bill of Rights academics and an expert in international commercial law. Her work is known and respected around the world and she has held visiting appointments in Europe, Asia, Australia, North and South America and Africa. Professor Butler has published extensively in the areas of domestic and international human rights, public and private comparative law and private international law with an emphasis on international commercial contracts. She is the co-author of the series Small States in a Global World and co-author with Dr Andrew Butler of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990, a commentary which is in its second edition and is considered the authoritative text relating to the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act. Professor Butler began her tertiary education in Germany before completing her Master of Laws in 1992 at this university at the same time clocking up some experience as a tutor in the law faculty. She served for a time as a judge's clerk in the South African Constitutional Court and she worked with the Ministry of Justice's Bill of Rights Human Rights Team. Professor Butler completed her PhD studies at the University of Göttingen in Germany in 1998 and joined the law faculty at Victoria University of Wellington in 2000. Professor Butler's contribution to the law faculty and to the university more broadly goes well beyond top quality scholarship. She is an innovative teacher who isn't afraid to try new things and who works incredibly hard to provide opportunities for our students. By way of example, she's been heavily involved over the past decade in taking teams to the Vis Moot in Vienna, one of the most prestigious moot court competitions in the world. The university's teams are highly regarded and have enjoyed great success over the years. Professor Butler is a qualified lawyer in Germany and a New Zealand qualified barrister. She regularly advises government departments and the profession on issues in the areas of her research and teaching interests. Professor Butler's current focus is on the synergy between business and human rights and in how private law can facilitate human rights compliance. Her energy and passion for the subject leads her to engage with a broad audience both in New Zealand and overseas. One example is her directorship of the Institute of Small and Micro States, an independent platform for analysis and debate on contemporary legal issues small states face with an eye on practical solutions. In this lecture, Professor Butler will explore the idea that businesses have human rights too, and will look at why businesses' access to justice is often violated. She will discuss a project undertaking global empirical research into contractual behaviour of small and medium-sized enterprises. Drawing on this research, Professor Butler will offer a new framework for how businesses can effectively realise their rights to access justice. Please join me in welcoming Professor Butler to the podium. Vice-Chancellor, Dean, members of the judiciary, colleagues from the faculty, the university, the legal profession, students, friends, Connor, Killian, Clara and my mother and my family and my friends on the other side of the world. Um, this is live streamed so they can see me. <laughs> and everyone who came tonight, I'm honored that you have come to share my inaugural lecture with me. I would like to start this lecture with a story. Imagine a courtroom, the trial, a brutal rape. The trial is about to begin. The door opens and in walks a father with his about six-year-old son. The prosecutor and defense lawyer in unison draw a deep breath and are exasperated. They approach the bench and ask the presiding judge to use the court's authority and to remove the young boy from the public gallery 
since the matter on trial was nothing a young child should ever hear. The presiding judge smiles and refuses, and the trial goes ahead. I will come back to the story at the end of the lecture. And even though I would like you to follow my research journey, maybe you can slightly multitask and think about why <coughs> the little boy was allowed to stay. One question an inaugural quest lecture should answer is what drives the scholar's research? The question to my motivation, why I became an academic, is quickly answered and is a confession. I'm an addict. I'm an addict to learning and how to better fade that addiction than staying at university and becoming an academic. To answer the second part of the why, why my research interest lies in human rights in an international commercial law, I ha have to transport you back to the Cold War and a city called Braunschweig, 25 kilometers west of the former Iron Curtain. A city where, according to probably urban myth, it would have taken the Russians 20 minutes to have their tanks positioned in the middle of a city. A city where when I went to primary school, we, instead of earthquake drills, had air raid drills. But most importantly, were due to a high fence, soldiers, dogs, and mines, the world stopped. I struck up a pen, a pen pal friendship when I was about 10 with a distant cousin of mine at the other side of that impenetrable curtain. Her letters described the restrictions under which she was living. Her brother not being, able, to, uh, not being al able and allowed to study for political reasons. The inability to leave East Germany even for a holiday. So in my mind, also fueled by the then available media and adult conversations around me, my cousin's existence was very bleak. When I was about 14, I visited, and you have to take my word for it. To get to my cousin was complicated, from getting the visa to the border formalities. But what a surprise. The land behind the barbed wire, the mines, and the border guards was not a lot different from where I was from. Framework houses, gardens where the fruit trees were laden with fruit, barbecues, and children playing football. One of my most vivid memories of that visit is the cherry stone spitting competition after lunch. <laughs> the visit behind the Iron Curtain taught me three things. Firstly, how important it is to challenge generally held views, but also one's own assumptions and perceptions. Secondly, that things are seldom black and white, but very, very gray. And most importantly, that limits to one's humanity can be invisible, but must be made visible. That's an obligation. Leaves the question why I'm interested in international commercial law. In contrast to my distant cousin, I grew up in a family that could and did travel extensively, and whose house was like the United Nations. Visitors from all around the world sat at the dinner table, coupled and contrasted with the fact that I grew up in an area with 14% unemployment. Unsurprisingly, this was a theme song. That was our school leaving theme song. It instilled the desire, though, to understand the mechanisms how other countries tackle their problems, and in particular, how to generate employment and amplify it for me from, a ver from very early on, the symbiosis between business and human rights. So in the following, I would like to explore one aspect of the symbiotic relationship between human rights and business. The need for micro, small, and medium-sized businesses, or SMEs, to be able to fully utilize their right to access to justice so that we can enjoy our human rights. The re research underlying this exploration is not mine alone. It is a result of qualitative and quantitative empirical research, an interdisciplinary endeavor, a collaboration between practice and academia, 
and an international research alliance. I would like to thank and acknowledge everyone who has been part of this research venture. And I'm delighted that some of those are here tonight. So, right of this. SMEs, such as the Ethiopian and New Zealand Apparists in the photos, here we go. And I just want to, this is why I chose this, because I want to show you these things here are the beehives, the Ethiopian beehives. Um, make up about 97 to 99% of enterprises in any country or trading block. There's agreement among states, businesses, business councils, international organizations, and academics that SMEs are vital for economic growth. As the OECD representatively has emphasized, small and medium-sized enterprises are important for their contributions to employment, innovation, economic growth, and diversity, especially for developing countries to prompt to promote SMEs as a winning strategy. SMEs decentralize the wealth more equitable compared to large industries. In Ethiopia, for example, SMEs provide especially women with a source of income. In New Zealand, SMEs employ 30% of the workforce and contribute 28% of the GDP. Due to their contribution to the economy and economic growth, SMEs play an important role in poverty reduction. And poverty is not only deprivation of economic or material resources, but a violation of human dignity, fairness, and equality. Indeed, no social phenomenon is as comprehensive in its assault on human rights as poverty. Poverty erodes or nullifies economic and social rights, such as the right to health, adequate housing, food and safe water, and the right to education. It erodes civil and political rights too, such as the right to a fair trial, political participation, and security of the person. So can SMEs in turn have human rights that need protecting? The answer is yes, they can. And the reason is twofold. Firstly, because the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act says so. And the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act is not alone. So does the European Convention on Human Rights, for example. Secondly, because today we impose state-like responsibilities on businesses to uphold human rights in all countries where they operate. And to be very clear, I'm a vivid advocate of businesses' responsibility to safeguard human rights, and I have extensively published on that. However, with responsibilities, come rights. The obvious caveat is that some human rights protect our humanness, so being human, and they are, of course, are not applicable to businesses. Like civil society, SMEs will struggle to thrive without the rules and standards that hold public and pu private powers accountable. Freedoms such as the freedom of expression or association and the right to access to justice allow citizens to expose abuses related to corruption, public health, toxic pollution, and gender discrimination. At the same time, they enable the free flow of information, investment, and entrepreneurial innovation. When these freedoms are undermined, businesses in civil society alike are subject to law of the jungle instead of the rule of law. The right at the center of this lecture will be and is the right to access to justice. I will firstly briefly explain what the right to access to justice entails and then explain why it is violated in the case of SMEs trading across border before proposing a solution. The right to access to justice in the jurisprudence of courts and human rights tribunals around the world encompasses not only the right to access to the courts, but also the right to effective justice. That means a dispute resolution mechanism that is cost efficient, timely, neutral, and provides an expert solution to a, for a dispute. The right to effective justice is a cornerstone of the rights framework 
because respect and protection of human rights can only be guaranteed by the availability of effective remedies. The right is an essential component of the rules of law and is embedded in the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act in the right to natural justice. Why is the right to access to effective justice particularly important in the cross-border trade context? It is uncontroversial among economists that the growth of today's economies is highly dependent on international trade. The expansion into international markets is critical for SME's continued growth and hence for the economy's well-being, poverty reduction, and therefore ultimately to protect, defend, and to maintain our human rights. However, only 38% of New Zealand's SMEs currently export their products, and the majority are not interested in overseas income. And New Zealand's SMEs are thereby far more adventurous than many other of their overseas uh, counterparts. Only 6% of UK SMEs trade cross-border, and you need to see that, that until probably the end of the year, the UK for a long time, 30, 30 years, was part of the EU, so had already quite a regulatory framework around it. One of the reasons for the limited foray into foreign markets by SMEs is the risk associated with doing so. The most commonly cited barrier for New Zealand SMEs is limited experience. The OECD study into barriers for SME in regard to conducting international businesses similarly found limited firm resources, international contacts, as well as the lack of requisite managerial knowledge about internationalization to be critical constraints to SMEs trading cross-border. Embedded in the resource experience and knowledge barrier is the risk associated with potential cross-border dispute resolution, whereby SMEs are not confident that they will be provided with effective commercial justice should a cross-border dispute arise. The European Commission study into intra-EU trade by SMEs found that one-third of respondents felt that the unknown resolution of cross-border conflicts stifled their cross-border trade, and that's within the EU. The World Bank IMF reported that efficient and transparency in dispute resolution were pivotal in encouraging trade across border. In other words, research suggests that SMEs perceive that their right to access to justice, to cross-border commercial justice, is not guaranteed. So what's the status quo? Is that perception correct? Is the right to cross-border commercial justice limited for SMEs? Let us have a look at the current cross-border commercial dispute resolution regime available to SMEs. To date, SMEs which engage in cross-border trade are free to agree in front of which country's court they want to get their disputes heard, or to means of dispute resolution outside any country's court system, such as international arbitration or mediation. However, qualitative and quantitative research conducted in New Zealand and by my research partners found that SMEs generally lack the knowledge, inclination, resources, or bargaining power to incorporate either a favorable jurisdiction clause, that means agree to their dispute being heard in a court of their choice, and that would be normally their own, or alternative dispute resolution processes such as arbitration or mediation into their contracts. If parties do not agree to a particular dispute resolution mechanism, international trade between private parties operates under a default dispute resolution system of international litigation. That means the dispute will be heard by a court determined by, a particular, applica by particular applicable rules. And herein lies the issue. It is generally accepted that international litigation in its current form does not provide a 21st century response to the needs of parties in the case of cross-border commercial disputes. Or to put it another way, that default cross-border litigation does violate the SME's right to access to an effective dispute resolution mechanism, a mechanism that is cost-efficient, timely, neutral, and expert solution of a dispute. 
So what is wrong with the current default mechanism of cross-border litigation? Let's start with an example. Nelson Honey in 2015 found itself in a dilemma. It had contracted with a Singaporean distributor for sale of Manuka honey to China, but did not have a written contract. When the honey arrived in Shanghai, the distri Singaporean distributor found that the Manuka honey had not the expected color and refused to take delivery of the honey. Nelson Honey firmly had of the view that its honey didn't leave anything to be desired for, and surprisingly wanted its purchase price, and sued the Singaporean uh, distributor in the High Court in Nelson. Well, of course, the Singaporean distributor wanted the honey, so they sued the, for another new batch of Manuka honey in the High Court in Singapore. Both courts decided that they had jurisdiction. That means they found they were the right court to hear the case. So you are looking at parallel court proceedings for both companies, an extra set of lawyers, laws that they are not quite, probably not quite familiar with, and potentially two diametrically opposed court judgments which would lead to another probably 10 years in the courts trying to enforce those judgments. The costs are enormous, the outcome uncertain. And Nelson Honey was lucky. Since Singapore shares a commonwealth and common law history with New Zealand, laws are different, but not too unfamiliar, and English is the common language. So this is basically a um, best case scenario. However, the fact that there are no final judgments strongly suggests that Nelson Honey and the Singaporean distributor, in light of the uncertainties and costs of the parallel proceedings, settled their dispute. Lawyers describe the deficiencies of international litigation as sexfold. Firstly, the lack of neutrality. Commercial parties frequently doubt that national courts, particularly the courts of the home jurisdiction of their counterparty, will render an unbiased and competent decision. Secondly, lack of experience and expertise. Very few, if any, national courts can consistently provide the specialized expertise appropriate for commercial disputes, which not only have a foreign element, but might be in addition also commercially and factually complex. Thirdly, the risk of multiple litigation. And in practice, and that has the Nelson Honey example shown, cross-border disputes often lead to litigation in multiple fora. The complexity of handling a multiplicity of proceedings is compounded by the inevitable risk of conflicting decisions. Fourthly, cost and time to resolve disputes. The very real risk of multiple parallel proceedings and cross-border disputes also leads to prohibitive costs and delays. Parties often have to layer counsel, first engaging a local counsel and then appointing a foreign counsel in each of the various potentially you know, relevant jurisdictions. Moreover, enforcement of judgments often requires multiple sets of lawyers in different jurisdictions. In many cases, litigation is slow, with proceedings taking many years to conclude and then being subject to even lengthier delays for appellate review, followed by yet further delays for enforcement. And that brings me to my fifth point, that is the enforcement of judgments. Different jurisdictions apply different rules when enforcing foreign judgments. This is when you try to get what the judgment tells you, yeah, and that is normally where your assets lie, and that does, does, has, might, has nothing to do with the two countries or the country where the judgment is rendered. So assuming the parties obtain a judgment from a national court, it of, it's often difficult or impossible for the judgment to be enforced abroad. And lastly, the uncertainty and predict, unpredictability. The factors outlined, just outlined introduce a significant degree of uncertainty and unpredictability, which the parties have le little means to influence. In summary, the current form of cross-border litigation does not meet the requirements of a neutral, efficient, and fair dis dispute resolution process, process that is legally enforceable. 
the deficiencies of cross-border litigation have been acknowledged by and have been the focus of the Hague Conference, an international body which just this month adopted a convention which aims to make the enforcement of judgments easier. However, given the status of its siblings convention, which was adopted 12 years ago, and which was the first step in ameliorating the ills of cross-border litigation on the international plane, nothing will change for SMEs soon. So what's the problem? The unsatisfactory solution for many SMEs seems to be to self-hedge, restricting their cross-border trade, thereby restricting the potential growth and benefits such trade could generate. Alternatively, SMEs potentially expose themselves to the serious risk of cross-border litigation, often resulting in unfair and catastrophic results for small enterprises. This is why we interviewed SMEs in New Zealand and abroad to find out how SMEs negotiate and conclude cross-border contracts and how they manage their dispute resolution risk to then be able to propose a solution. So the New Zealand study interviewed 48 SMEs, and that sounds not a lot, but actually for anybody who does empirical uh, qualitative study, it is quite a, quite a good number. From manufacturing to agricultural products, including also some IT uh, products, for example, located around the country. I was at places in New Zealand I'd never been before. It was really interesting. The study also interviewed four large companies from different sectors located in different parts of the country. This research is supplemented with available research from the International Research Alliance, which is still work in progress, which allows for global insight into SME's contractual behavior. And I would like to share with you three of the findings of that global research today. Firstly, the lack of a single contract document, the lack of awareness of legal issues and the lack of engagement of and with legal services, and the perceived ingenuity of SMEs. So starting with the lack of, of, of a single contract document, the New Zealand and Spanish studies found that many SMEs do not have one single contract document. Contracting is done, and that's what we want as lawyers, we want one nice single contract document. Contracting is done in a piecemeal fashion frequently through a mixture of emails, phone calls, and even WhatsApp and WeChat, WeChat if you contract with China, order forms, export, export documentations, or a bill of ladings are often the most comprehensive one single document of the contract. But over 50% of SMEs are not even using order forms, bill of ladings, or letter of credits, the research found. However, has to be said, the more complex a product, for example, a product that contains intellectual property rights or involves distribution agreements, the more, li more likely it is that a single all-encompassing contract document exists. Whether there is a need for a formal contract document might also depend on in which country the contractual partner is located. Nearly 100% of the Austrian MSME have a single contract document. And we can maybe discuss over a glass of wine why that is. New Zealand SMEs expressed a general mistrust of contractual documents. There was some reluctance to require contractual um, counterparts to sign legalistic looking documents perceived as using verbose clauses to contemplate everything that has the potential to go wrong with a particular transaction. The importance of maintaining a relationship between the parties substituted for any written contract. As one participant emphasized, good relations are important to me. I'm not really interested in doing deals just for the sake of deals. I would much rather work on relationships than signing documents and working at a level of distrust. Interestingly, even one of the large businesses interviewed stated that contract documents which contained, in that case, a choice of law and dis dispute resolution clause, so it was a state-of-the-art contract, were just springboards for negotiations and were not really relied upon. They were kept at the bottom of the drawer and they were left there. 
So coming to the lack of awareness of legal issues and the lack of engagements of and with legal services. SMEs globally lack resources to engage legal advice or to deal with the associated processes on top of the day job, trying to sustain and to grow their business. In addition, SMEs generally lack awareness of the complexity of the potential legal issues, illustrated by the comment of one of the New Zealand participants. If someone comes to do, to do, uh, to do business, then I guess my gut feeling would be that whatever law we work in always applies. So if somebody brings me from the US and wants to buy something from me, then I assume that they come to us, so our law must apply. The moment we call them, then US law might apply. And this SME is not alone. In, in a contract between an Australian and an Ital Italian SME, the parties agreed that when the Italian buyer would not pay the purchase price, the Australian seller would be able to sue the buyer in Australia under Australian law, and vice versa. If the goods were not conforming with the contract, the Italian buyer would sue the Australian seller in the Italian courts under Italian law. And even though that seems quite a common sense approach, yeah, I can just take it from me legally, that's quite a nightmare. <laughs> SMEs are often not aware that in cross-border contract, contracting, additional issues might arise, which is evidenced by the fact that over 50% of businesses we interviewed and so on never engage a lawyer when negotiating a contract or when a dispute arises, and that was is quite a staggering result. Well, another down-to-earth dispute risk management approach was, and this is absolutely my favorite one, echoing perceptions may be gained by watching US legal drama. So, no, because America, you know, don't kid yourself. The Americans are not going to sue me. I could poison and kill an American with my product, and they wouldn't sue me because the lawyers would not make enough. They could take me to the cleaners, they could take my business, they could take my wife and children and sell them into slavery, and they still would not make enough to pay the lawyer's fees. <laughs> Fur furthermore, in relation to international matters, an SME's usual lawyer might not have a broad knowledge of the best uh, practice for key clauses in an international commercial contract. This may be particularly true for smaller firms located in regional areas of New Zealand or Spain or Austria with lawyers who engage in a broad range of legal services for both private and commercial clients. Many small businesses will customarily refer all their legal queries and issues to the same lawyer. When asked about the use of drafted documents for international transactions, one participant reported, I wouldn't have a clue where to start. And I also probably would fear that if I went to my usual lawyer, he wouldn't have a clue either. Okay, last point, the perceived ingenuity of SMEs. An interesting, slightly counter implication of multitasking SME management is their involvement with an understanding of the day-to-day -day performance of contracts, as well as the negotiation thereof. In general, in general, smaller businesses will also have fewer customers and fewer individual transactions than larger firms. Where a firm has fewer customers and fewer transactions, it is possible for the management to hold the reins and be personally in control and assess the risk of individual transactions. Smaller businesses may hereby have an increased ability to be selective in whom they deal with and operate on the basis of relationships rather than formal processes. All 48 participants of the New Zealand study stressed that trust was the essential element of their business relationship and that has been corroborated worldwide for us. When asked whether documents for sale of a dis distributor included anything about dispute resolution or applicable law, one participant said, no, eventually we will have to go there, but at the moment, the relationships are really personal, and I deal personally with all these people. And when you're sitting across the table face to face, you work it out. Since trust is the core ingredient of the business relationship, SMEs globally spend considerable amount of time and energy 
of finding out about their potential contractual partner, including to travel to meet the potential new con contract partner or inviting them to New Zealand, and asking around within the industry whether the potential partner is reliable. As a New Zealand participant explains, there's a number of things we do. We start a dialogue with people, we talk to others who they know in that market about them. We may, we may use New Zealand Trade and Enterprise to look and see whether they are legitimate or not. This is echoed by a Singaporean SME in the wholesale trading business. We do the checks on the buyers, we visit them at least once and know them well. So to conclude that part, the study so far has revealed that the extent of the SME's lack of what lawyers would call legal sophistication when it comes to contracting cross-border and the lack of resources are generally underestimated. Allocation both in time and energy to the various tasks and responsibilities an SME management must perform means that often even awareness of a potential legal risk is not raised neither as information sought should awareness be present regarding even relatively simple, let alone complex legal issues. Some SMEs interviewed for the study had lucky escapes. They were either able to settle their disputes before or during a cross-border uh, uh, cross litigation, or they were able to walk away from the business relationship without losing their business, only to never trade with a business from that country again. Others were very wary making a foray into for foreign markets. For over 50% of New Zealand and Austrian SMAs, dispute resolution concerns were an issue when venturing into a foreign market. This corroborates the findings of the World Bank, the IMF, and the European Commission studies. Or they spend a considerable time and money into finding out about their prospective foreign business partner. So what do we need to do about this? Any proposed solution should not only ameliorate the pitfalls of cross-border litigation, most fully vindicate the SME's right to access to effective commercial cross-border justice, but also consider and honor the cornerstones of SME contracting. Firstly, that the contractual relationship is built on trust over documents, and that negotiation is always the first attempt to resolve a dispute. It also needs to consider the nature of SME contracting, the lack of awareness of the cross-border dispute resolution risks, the lack of bargaining power, the lack of time and awareness to seek information to be educated. Over two-thirds of SMEs do not use the service of the Chambers of Commerce. That is also quite a staggering result. What is needed is a new default cross-border dispute resolution system, a system that automatically is applicable if an SME has not put its mind to the dispute resolution risk and cannot negotiate a solution, but that also has some attraction to the larger foreign business partner of the SME, should there be one. One dispute resolution regime which holds some promise tackling most of the ills of cross-border litigation is international arbitration. Arbitration is a dispute resolution regime whereby the parties in dispute agree on another individual in their private capacity or even a tribunal of two, three or more people to make a final and binding <coughs> determination regarding the disputed matter. The adjudicators do not have to be <laughs> lawyers. The parties are free to agree on how the arbitration is to be conducted. International arbitration has been used for over 2,000 years, however, has gained favor among especially actually multinationals in the last 30. How does international arbitration fare against the six issues earlier identified that make cross-border litigation unsuitable to provide an effective cross-border commercial dispute resolution mechanism for SMEs? Looking first at neutrality. Since the parties are free to choose the, persons, the person or persons adjudicating the disputes, the parties can ensure neutrality. The lack of experience and, and uh, experience and expertise. Again, the parties are free to choose the arbitrator who does not need to be a lawyer. Hence, the parties can ensure 
that experts hear the dispute. And that is actually frequently done, for example, in construction arbitrations, engineers instead of lawyers are chosen as arbitrators. Thirdly, the risk of parallel or multiple proceedings. The risk of parallel proceedings is minimal. Courts honor the valid choice of the parties to arbitrate that is based on the right to freedom of contract, and so will another arbitral tribunal. The cost and time to resolve disputes. In recent years, cost and time have become an issue in international arbitration among multinationals and larger businesses. However, com commodity arbitration and maritime arbitrations are good examples for cost-efficient and timely arbitrations. Importantly, arbitration does not require a special set of counsel, and that's a huge money saver. The obstacle to enforceability. In the ability to easily enforce an arbitral award around the world, lies one of the greatest advantages of international arbitration. This is due to the New York Convention in place for the last 60 years and ratified since Friday by 160 countries out of 193 in the UN, PNG signed last Friday. The convention mandates the enforcement of a foreign arbitral award in a member country. So lastly, and to summarize, uncertainty and unpredictability. Of course, no system is perfect. However, due to the parties having control over the process, for example, over the language in which the proceedings should be conducted, and that can be more than one, the timelines and whether witnesses should be heard, proceedings are much more predictable. Importantly, parties can decide where hearings should be conducted and even to hold a hearing virtually. So that would lower the carbon footprint, wouldn't it? How would international arbitration become the default uh, resolution mechanism for SMEs? Cross-border litigation, that's, that's the real, one of the real, also real issues. Cross-border litigation is mandated through national laws that set out when a court has jurisdiction in a case with a foreign a party based on comity among sovereign states. And the Nelson Honey ca case, an example, actually illustrates that comity definitely has its limits. Since every state has sovereignty over its subjects, a state could not adopt a law binding subjects of another state to a particular dispute resolution mechanism to, to the exclusion of the other state's courts. However, states could agree among themselves to sub substitute cross-border litigation with international commercial arbitration as a default dispute resolution regime between commercial entities trading between those states. Such agreement would be by way of a treaty between two or more states and is in line with the response to research recently undertaken where stakeholders have expressed enthusiasm for a regional business-to-business -business dispute resolution system. Free trade agreements, FDAs, or bilateral investment treaties, BITs, own their existence to the desire to foster trade, and more lately, especially among SMEs, by lowering regulatory trade barriers such as tariffs and customs. If they are successful, it follows that more trade will result between the businesses of those countries. More cross-border relationships mean more disputes. To include a business-to-business -business dispute resolution mechanism based on the principles of international arbitration in FDAs and BITs would ensure that not only SMEs have access to an effective cross-border dispute resolution mechanism when taking advantage of the fruits of an FDA or BIT, but it also would eliminate another trade barrier. In the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, an attempt in the direction of the proposed solution has been made by obliging the state parties, I quote, to the maximum extent possible to encourage and facilitate the use of arbitration for the settlement of international commercial disputes between private parties. A dispute mechanism based on the principle of arbitration would be the default dispute resolution mechanism. Parties would, of course, remain free to opt out of that regime and choose a regime of their choice, including agreeing, if they really wanted to, to settle their dispute in front of a court. The dispute resolution mechanism would prescribe those factors ordinarily found in a full arbitration agreement, 
the rules according to which the arbitration is to be conducted, the number of arbitrators and the appointing mechanism. And luckily, UNCTRAL, which is the commercial arm of the UN, has issued already rules of arbitration which represent an international best practice and maximum mutuality and would be therefore ideal to incorporate. Default arbitration under an FDA or BIT could ease many of the concerns raised regarding cross-border litigation generally. It prevent parallel proceedings, provide for expert adjudicators and an easier means of enforcement of any issued award. The FDA BIT arbitration regime could also alleviate legal issues that are of particular concerns to SMEs and could level the playing field between larger and smaller businesses to highlight just three of those benefits. Well, firstly, taking account of when designing the procedure of the SME's contract cornerstones. Trust and negotiation. By allowing and encouraging and maybe demanding a period of negotiation or mediation. Secondly, designing a procedure that takes account of environmental sustainability by allowing for the use of online processes. And thirdly, setting out a mandatory cost structure. However, nothing is ever perfect. The proposal raises four counter arguments. The apparent affront to constitutional guarantee of access to the courts and related to an apparent affront against the core constitutional principle of separation of powers, the existence of regimes that already seek to address some of the problems of international litigation, and a fear of the unknown. Those concerns, however, can be diffused. Firstly, regarding the limitation of the right to access to the courts, parties will have access to the courts when an award is enforced, where the courts hold a certain supervisory power. In addition, it has been argued that the right to access to the courts only encompasses the right to access to the national courts, which in a cross-border situation does not exist as per right. Most importantly, the right to access to the courts, as well as the right to effective justice, are both part of the right to access to justice, and therefore have to be balanced against each other. The right to the courts is meaningless if the courts are not able to provide effective justice where an alternative regime exists. More heavily weighs the proposed regime's violation of the core principle of a modern democratic state, separation of powers. The proposed regime, one could argue, deprives the courts as one of the powers of government of an entire segment of its work, namely commercial cases pertaining to a particular geographical area if we talk about FDIBIT. However, the courts are not getting the cases at the moment either, albeit for different reasons, because as the research has found, cross-border litigation is the least favored dispute resolution mechanism for SMEs and large businesses alike. The proposed regime at least would give the courts of the country where the enforcement is sought some supervisory power. That means courts would retain their power as an arm of the government. Thirdly, regarding the argument that efforts to ameliorate the deficiencies of cross-border litigation are on the way, yes, there are. So far, those have been of very limited success. Fourthly, the fear of the unknown. When New Zealand enacted the excellent compensation scheme, it was unique and a step of a, and a complete step into the unknown. Far more unknown what is propo proposed regarding the FDA or BIT commercial dispute resolution scheme. In summary, commercial disputes resolution regime based on the principles of international arbitration incorporated in an FDA BRT will benefit the Ethiopian apiarist as much as the New Zealand one. It, ca it can ensure that an SME has access to effective justice should it need it. It will remove another barrier to trade for SMEs. One New Zealand SME owner stated that's quite interesting, that he could care less about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that was a little bit while ago. But his concern was his potential US business partners who seem to be reluctant to contract with them for fear of potentially ending up in a New Zealand court. To reduce poverty and to safeguard our rights, we need SMEs globally to trade and to trade cross-border. 
That means we need to provide them with a framework in which they can access their rights to effective cross-border justice. There are two tasks left for me. To tell you the end of the story with which I started. The reason the judge smiled, who was my father, and allowed the boy to listen to the rape trial was because the boy and his family were visiting us and did not speak one word of German. <laughs> He and, his, he and his father were just interested how a German criminal trial was conducted and see my father at work. And I can ensure you neither my brother or I were allowed to watch. For me, the story encapsulates what academia is about. Never take what you see as given. Challenge you, but also everyone else's perception. Never easily accept the obvious answer. I would like to conclude with thanking wholeheartedly the many people who have contributed to me being able to share my research with you today through friendship, collegial support, mentorship, by challenging me. But in particular, my parents, my father died two years ago, Clara, Connor, and Killian. Thank you. En a mana, en a reo, en a karangaranga maha tena koto. No mai kite kororo, wahapu o ahorangi Petra Butler. I am just expressing my gratitude and appreciation for the eloquence of my colleague, Professor Petra Butler. Ko Mark Hickford Taku Igoa, I stand before you as Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of Law and my task is to offer a vote of thanks in closing the ceremonies for this evening before we depart for refreshments. I wish to thank Professor Petra Butler for a bold and challenging inaugural lecture. Businesses have human rights too. This evening's lecture falls very much within her current research focus on the alignments and misalignments between businesses and human rights and on how private law can facilitate human rights compliance. In essence, she contemplates the publicness and relationality of private law, how trust is built, buttressed and nourished through relationships and many dialogues, what James Tully, the Canadian philosopher, calls multilogue, many conversations. In doing so, she has expressed interesting, intriguing confessions. She tells us that she is an addict. She is addicted to curiosity, to the pursuit of uncertainties and shades of grey. In doing so, she gave us snippets of the Talking Heads classic with the vocals of David Byrne talking of a road to nowhere. And in doing so, took us on a journey to somewhere and everywhere, the personal and local, while portraying sensitive global views, crossing seas, islands, and continents, lines as borders were no trouble to her lecture. I now propose, therefore, a vocative of thanks. I did have the pleasure a number of years ago, as Petra knows, of introducing her as a new professor at a dinner on the 22nd of February 2017. At that time, we rightfully honoured her for her prodigious energy and her commitment to ensuring our students have international reach. As many of you will know, she has been heavily involved throughout the past decade, and the Vice-Chancellor reminded us in his opening remarks in taking teams to the other side of the world, the Wismut in Vienna, one of the most prestigious moot court competitions in the world. I believe this evening you've heard how her lecture demonstrates the comparable commitment and energy to international reach in her own research. Before inviting everyone to refreshments in the Ian McKinnon atrium just next door, please join me in thanking Professor but Petra Butler for treating us to a thought-provoking lecture. Thank you.